Hello everybody, I am your host Mike Valente. This is SMG Hangouts and I am hanging out with Toronto Mike from the Toronto Mike podcast. Toronto Mike, I'm Richmond Hill Mike. How you doing? Nice to meet you, Richmond Hill Mike. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Do you meet a lot of Mikes from other cities? Every third guy is named Mike. <laughs> That's true. Especially if you're born in the 70s or 80s, every, every other guy. Yeah, it's a very popular name. But I own that trademark, so my lawyers will be in touch. Okay, great. Perfect. That's just what I need. I want to ask you about the podcast, obviously, off the top. What was the motivation to start it? And why interviewing television and radio people specifically? The motivation was I was doing the digital back end for a couple of famous Toronto radio guys, Humble and Fred. Oh. So they would create the content, which they had been doing for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And then they were like, Mike, we, we know how to create a show, but then what's a podcast? Like, how does this piece of audio become a podcast? And that's where I would come in, right. handle all the back end, the XML, the whole infrastructure, the scalable back end infrastructure so they could actually podcast regularly. Mm -hmm. So I helped them set, set them up. Yeah. I watched them do their thing for a couple of weeks and then a couple of months. And then I got this itch, like I, an itch I needed to scratch, which was like, okay, could I handle the A to Z of a broadcast like this? Like, I know the back end, but could I actually do the part, you know, creating the content, hosting, uh, recording, creating a quality MP3 file, right. and hand it to myself to take it the rest of the way. So yeah. I decided to leave my comfort zone, yeah. bought myself some quality gear so I could have a professional sounding studio, and I started Toronto Mike. Right. And how did the, the first few shows go? Like, what was that process like for you? Was it, did you ease into it slowly but surely, or? I was not sure what Toronto Mike was until I had been doing it for about 30 to 40 episodes. Like, it was one of those things where I needed to do it to learn what it was. I really had to put in the reps, and I go back and listen to the early episodes, and I cringe a little bit because it's like, I had a lot to learn, but you, the only way I knew to learn was to do it. So I literally would uh, shoot the breeze with a friend about current events and things going on in our lives. And that was pretty much Toronto Mike for the first 20 to 30 episodes until it found its voice, it found its rhythm, and then it became the show it has been for 366 episodes. Well, there you go, not that you're counting. <laughs> I'm counting. <laughs> who, said counting. I was, who said I wasn't counting? <laughs> That's a good point. I think you honestly are a perfect example though of someone before you started this podcast who had no broadcasting experience whatsoever. Uh, so I think you really are proof that people can create their own content and be successful, wouldn't you say? Well, not only that, I, I always hated my voice. Like I felt it was too high pitched. I'm like, I'm the last guy who should be broadcasting anywhere. And I would, the last thing I would consider doing is recording my voice for public consumption. Like forget mm -hmm. it. So not only no stitch of uh, experience in the broadcasting world, not even close, the closest I came was producing podcasts for people like Humble and Fred. Yeah. But I had no broadcasting experience whatsoever. So I literally just followed my instincts. I had a couple of uh, people I modeled myself after who I always liked. And it found, like I said, it literally organically, authentically found its tone and voice yeah. by doing it. For sure. So. Who were some of those inspirations? You, you're a young man. I thought you were going to say me. I'm like, there's no way it's me. <laughs> Who's this guy? <laughs> <laughs> Brian Linehan had a show, uh, and I want to get the name, City Line or City Lights? Maybe it was City Lights. Okay. Uh, that was on City TV when I was growing up. I watched Brian Linehan, and he did his homework. And he'd have a guest, a famous person would come on, and this is pre-Wikipedia and internet. There was no internet back then. He knew his stuff, and the guest was always impressed by the research. It would give these really profound, interesting answers, because it wasn't the same questions they had fielded it a hundred times. Yeah. So I came into it, basically I was gonna do my homework and I, forever, I always do my homework. And I was going to ask, I call it real talk. It wasn't called real talk until Strombo called it real talk in episode 103 and then it's like, oh, this is real talk, hashtag real talk. But I was going to ask the questions fans wanted to ask. Like I was gonna ask the questions where you don't hear asked on typical uh, mainstream media two minute, right. two to five minute uh, segments. Yeah, no, for sure. I was gonna deep dive and ask all the questions you'd want asked of the particular yeah. guests. So. so what about today? Like if someone out there watching right now wants to start their own podcast, what advice would you have for them? Because there's a lot of them now. It's very popular to have a podcast. I do it, like uh, you, if I can do it, you can do it. <laughs> that sounds right. cliche, right? Yeah. But I'm, I'm six years in, it's just, it's really, starting to pick up steam six years in. I've had so many fascinating people come over to my home to do these deep dives. Like mm -hmm. just people I've always idolized and, and, and 
and thought highly of her coming over to answer my questions for 90 minutes to two hours. I just recorded today for two and a half hours with somebody and it was fascinating. So you just, just do it. Like, uh, it's, it's something we can all do because you can broadcast for yourself now. You don't need to have a terrestrial radio station. Do it, and if you're not even sure what it is, do it until you figure out what it is. And that's my advice. For sure. Just yeah. do it. Of all the people you've interviewed, all the broadcasters, all the TV and radio people, have you found that there's a common trait in, in some of these people, maybe the more successful ones that have sustained a career in, in broadcasting and media? Yeah, I think the common trait is that they're, they're available to do whatever it takes. So many times I hear, you know, they would show, even if they weren't being paid very well or at all, they would be there willing to do whatever. And sometimes it was, you have to be good to have a career, of course. But sometimes it's timing and being there. Like so many times I hear some guy was sick and this person was there all the time because they wanted to help out or whatever. And then this person, they said, hey, can you do this? And they stepped in. Next thing you know it, 20 years later, they're famous Canadian media personality. So like a big part is being there and willing to do whatever it takes regardless of the, the compensation, I mm -hmm. would say. So that, I hear that story over and over again. Which guests do you find generate the most traffic and awareness for your podcast? You might get a really big name, but they don't share it on social media, so the, it doesn't get out there as much as right. you'd like. Or you interview someone who's relatively big, who has a decent following, but they share it more. So have you, have you looked at those statistics? Uh, I used to be uh, fanatical about looking at the analytics. Mm -hmm. And this used to be something I did all the time. And then at some point I realized I don't need to stare at these numbers after every episode and see number of unique downloads. Like I, I reached a point where I was all about like interesting, compelling conversations, regardless of how big the name is. Uh, but having said that, um, I find that if you have a big sports media, for some reason, I found a following in the sports sports media group, a subset, if you will. Yeah. And if it's an Elliot Friedman or a Ron McLean or a Bob McKenzie or a James Duffy or Jay and Dan have been fantastic guests. And, and th that type of a guest, these national sports media uh, personas seem to, to resonate and create traction. And people just love hearing like, a, what is a Damian Cox really like when a guy like me chats him up for 90 minutes? And somebody like a Damian Cox comes back to play and discuss his 10 favorite songs of all time. Right. So for some reason I get a, there's a heavy appetite out there for more sports media personalities. But I personally like to uh, spread it around. I'll have a, a musician on one day, a, a, radio, a, a music radio host another day, a TV personality another day, and then a sports media personality. So right. I like to diversify yeah. it personally. Yeah. Now you do the podcast from your home? Yeah. You have four kids? Yeah. That's crazy. It you manage crazy. all of this, right? How have you gone about generating like sponsorships and, and revenue? Maybe get, take us through that. Yeah, that is, so I did many, many episodes with zero monetization. Mm -hmm. I gotta say, I think I was at it a good two years, believe it or not. Never even thinking about monetizing it. I was doing it for love of the game. It's a passion project. I just wanted to improve and make compelling content and long form discussions. Mm -hmm. And then I received a call from a local craft brewery who had fallen in love with the show and kept hearing references to like, local like geographical local pl things and places like and they said I think you're in our neighborhood and I, I that turns out you know I'm in southwest Toronto by by the lake and it's like hey these guys are like in my backyard so they said hey come over let's have a meeting and I just biked over and I had to sit down and they made me an offer and I thought about it and I said okay I can monetize this a little bit like there's no shame in that I had to put big money into the gear and it's expensive to host these fat files that are being downloaded thousands and thousands of times so i accepted a sponsor and then someone else chimed in and wrote me an email and said hey can we get on board we'd love to sponsor you and then someone else so i've never hustled yeah. for a sponsor a day day in my life and these i'm lucky enough that i have four great sponsors right now and they came to me and said yeah. we'd like to uh support the show so. but that that's two years of not making money yeah and two years showing of nothing. That consistency yeah, yeah. paying off right in fact, I remember when I told my wife I was going to buy my own gear and she's like, okay, how much is everything? And I went to my buddy who's an audio guru. He does Blue Jay games for Sportsnet, Andrew Stokely. And he said, you need this, this, that, and that. You need these microphones because they're really good. And I, I added it all up. And the initial investment was something like $1,600. And at the time, it might as well have been uh, like $300,000. Like $1,600. It just seemed so enormous to me. And then mm -hmm. my wife said, okay, if you want to try this. And I said, yeah, I want to give this a go. 
And it's funny looking back, it's like the best investment I think I've ever made was yeah. like $1,600. For sure. And you've always been very tenacious in terms of like booking guests, right? Like sometimes you've emailed guests for years until they come on oh, your yeah. show. So that's something that's actually quite, uh, I think, uh, relevant in our industry as well is reaching out to people, networking. How do you walk that line of, you know, not bothering people by following up too much? It's, that's the, first of all, that's the worst part of the gig, yeah. if you will, is the booking and scheduling of guests. Mm -hmm. I wish everybody who was interested in coming on would just send me an email and say, hey, I'd love to come on. That's what I wish. But I will always reach out to the people I'm interested in and I say, hey, would you like to come on? I tell them a bit about the show. Now I get to link them to some place that lists like a laundry list of all their uh, colleagues that have been on, which I think is helping me. It's like, hey, hey, Bob McKenzie did it. Why aren't you doing it? And then, but, but back in the day, I just kind of told them what I was up to and said, hey, would you like to come on? So if I get a no, mm -hmm. I shut it down for years. Okay, I got, I've been trying to get bookie on my show. I got oh, okay. a no. I shut it down for like two years and then I'll send them a note two years later. I know you said no a couple of years ago, but I thought maybe this is a better time. And if I get another no, I shut it down for good. Yeah. Okay, so I don't pester anybody. But I usually get a, oh, I'm a bit busy right now, but maybe in the fall or yeah. got, I'm going to be out of town, but follow up with me in six months. So those types of guests who are interested in coming on but aren't ready to book a date and time, we might go back and forth for years. With Maestro Fresh West, we did four years of back and forth. And Romer. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was five years of back and forth before she finally paid a visit and then we had a great chat. So yeah, yeah. if you're interested, but I will every month or so kind of ping you and say, hey, can right. we book a date and time? Right. Do you, do you get reflective sometimes after six years of doing this and looking back at the very start being like, I'm so glad I went forward with this idea? Like, how do you reflect on what it's been? I mean, it's been so rewarding because I'm having deep conversations with interesting people like it's really re rewarding and now I'll sit down with somebody and they'll mention a name and I'll remember oh I spent two hours with that guy and then they'll mention another name and oh yeah I spent 90 minutes like it's really made me better at my job like having all this like quality one-on-one -on -one time with these personalities and now I'm sort of a walking it's almost annoying because these are I call them fun facts but some people think they're useless facts but I'm full of like inside Canadian media factoids and how everyone's yeah. connected and right. I'm just these spill out of me like all day long so I mean if you're into that kind of thing you should like hang out with me because it'd be a lot of, like a jukebox it'd be a yeah, lot of fun I think. exactly right? but if that stuff is kind of annoying I feel like that character in Kids in the Hall the kid who had all those annoying fun facts like it's that's not cool man but it's right up your alley so it works for you it is right? what it is right but yeah well congratulations on all your success it's a pleasure to have you here on our show so thank you very much for coming in thanks so much for the invitation there you go Toronto Mike everybody here on SMG Hangouts